Last week, I kind of took that and went through a bunch of examples of like, as Mina said, symptoms or barriers that prevent us from problems. Some things we can notice. For example, just something really small, like when we can't express our feelings to people. When we actually, someone tells us to do something we don't want to do, and we just say yes, we can't say no. There's certain things, and we went through a whole talk about tons of examples of how we maybe are unable to do certain things. And these are like kind of clear examples that we are, we still need to grow. So this series itself can be a very uh, uh, emotional, a very uh, sometimes painful topic to some people. Because it's not easy. It's a hard thing to kind of assess yourself deep down and work. It's not an easy thing. But we said it's really, really worth it. It's really worth it. Now, today's talk, we're dedicated to, as you said, the catchy phrase that uh, the group came up with is getting past the past. So a lot of times, this is probably, in my opinion, I think, uh, the hardest talk or the hardest point of, of the series is getting past our past or facing our past. So a lot of times, we spoke about why I can't say no to why I'm upset, why I don't deal with these emotions properly, why I don't do this, 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 and that, and why I'm not wrong. I say to myself, why am I doing this? So we kind of acknowledged and pointed out what are the things, what are the signs that you know we need to kind of dig deep into ourselves and, and, and reflect on ourselves. But we say, what is it? Why is it this way? What is the root cause or problem of this? So I'll just give a little example. So now that I have Ethan, when we got Ethan, I remember two interesting things that I, I didn't know. So we played some music and, and hymns and songs that Pregnant. And then we noticed later, like after he gave birth, for some reason, like one time she was pregnant, she was he was kicking, he was in her belly. So I was like, wow, so he likes this song. Like, a couple times turned it on, and he liked it. So I started singing it once or twice after, kind of like, where she played it, and he liked it. Like, oh, so he remembered. And then there was a specific hymn that he used to go cry and whatever, and, and then if I sing this hymn, he'd calm down. It was like, it was listening to this different reason. I don't know, maybe I was singing it a bunch of times when she was pregnant, I don't remember what it was, but certain things that he calmed down and liked it. And he remembered it. So I'm like, you know, even at this age where he's not even like born yet, you know, he's still kind of, we have to, you know, there's an effect made. And eventually, if all of you to become fathers or mothers, God willing, you'll see that, um, there, you'll see even through the whole pregnancy how, how we act actually affects the baby and the stranger. Right? Um, so we say to ourselves, how much more during our life when we're actually outside of the womb, when we're growing up, how much more does every single thing or the environment around us affect us? In ways that we, don't even, we, not even, we may not even notice it. And that's what we've got to go back to now. Getting past the past. So we know that for every, every action, there's a reaction. For anything that happens, there's a consequence. And our families, keep in mind we're talking about the influence of our direct family, our uncles, our aunts, our parents, siblings, and even this kind of strength, this strand, this, this whole root of how we, we act and how we deal with things in our families, or as we are personally, is related not just to our parents, but to our grandparents and great grandparents. Right? Because certain things get passed down, just like certain genes get passed down. In a certain way, other things can get passed down, but not in the same way. But there is a strong influence. So, the, the basic things that we hear, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. These little, these quotes. And it makes sense, right? Like, like father, like son, right? All these things. And it's actually true. Because even the world acknowledges it. There is strong influence from the family. But, our big question is, why is facing the past so difficult? Why is it such a difficult thing? You all kind of know this. Why is facing the past one, because, you know, it's deep, you know, sometimes you have deep scars, certain things that happen before hurts, and it's just not good, it doesn't feel good to bring up the past, it doesn't feel good to talk about the past, to bring things up that hurt, to hold these scars up. A lot of times it just doesn't feel good, it's difficult, and honestly what we have, we get too emotional, we get upset, we get angry, we may cry, these are just the reaction, the emotional reaction, certain pain, certain things, that are very deep within us. This is really the main reason why we try to just ignore the past, ignore things that happened. 
And then another reason sometimes for people who feel like not too much, maybe there's not too much trauma throughout their life in the past, where certain things are less dramatic to them, they don't want to bring it up because they feel like they're shaming their family. How can I admit that my father and mother did this? How can I admit that my parents or siblings did this or my grandparents did this? How can I admit that? So to them, it's like, it's hard. And a lot of times when you confront your past, sometimes you need to talk about it. So it's like, am I, you know, fine, I confronted it myself, but, you know, what, I, I can't explain what my father did or mom did or my father. It's very hard. So one is it, you can, you can feel shame or embarrassed to speak about your family. And the second thing is, which is probably the bigger thing, is that it just hurts us. It hurts, we're sad, we don't want to cry about it, we don't want to feel hurt about it, we don't want to fall back into being depressed or anything. But these, there are things that we have to do in life to progress, and this is an important thing, is really facing the past. A lot of times, we're kind of in prison. We really are, deep down, we're in prison. Like we can grow this much, and we're being weighed down by our past, by all these things, because we're just not confronting it. So why do we have to face it? Really? I'll say a verse first from Matthew. That's very interesting. We've heard it before. Unless you love your love me, unless you love me more than your mother, father, sister, brother, you cannot be my son. So as we said, we follow patterns consciously and subconsciously that we grew up within our family environment. But when we come to follow Christ, simple things we kind of like Nina said before, I said before, we can kind of be in church, we can read the Bible, we can pray, we can serve, but we're still not growing spiritually enough. We're still tied down to things. And even the way we deal with things is not really Christian. And why it is? Because we didn't fully, fully, fully become disciples of Christ. Whereas in a sense, we are still disciples of our family, of the issues of our family, the things that were passed down from our family. So we need to fully, fully leave Christ. We said, you cannot love your parents when you need. You know, certain things, you gotta get through this hump. You gotta get, get over this mountain, and I'm with you. Therefore, you can be my disciple. So why do we need to face the past? One, because we really need to be free from it. We all know some of us deep down, we are still in pain, suffering from things that happen in the past. We need to be free. We need to live a free life. Christ came to set us free. What we meant by free is free from sin and free from anything that weighs us down. And of course, this helps us grow spiritually and emotionally. We need to grow. We don't want to say, you know, I haven't really enjoyed living in 30 years. I haven't really enjoyed reading the Word of God. I haven't really enjoyed interacting in church for 30 years. Really, 30 years, you still enjoy being around people in church. So there's a lot of things that are weighing us down. And of course, this will better our relationship with God. And believe it or not, it will better our relationship with our family. And I'll go through why. Getting through our past and facing our past will actually help our relationship with our family be much, much better. And of course, it will break the cycle. Because look, we all have experienced things with our families. And believe it or not, we try not to pass it on to our new family, to our children. But if we don't really face it, we will pass down the same thing, if not a different reaction to what happened in our family that can be very different, but still hurtful. So we're not really breaking the cycle. It's just being transformed in a different way. And we don't want that for our families, right? We want to bring new generations of, of, of great kids that can reach have no barriers to their potential. So as we go forward, the question I always ask myself, so how do we actually approach this difficult topic? What do I say? You know? One, we need to understand we're not judging our parents or our grandparents or our family if we go back and do So then we feel like I'm judging them, you know? I'm pointing out all their flaws. No, we acknowledge that there's so much good that they gave us. But you know what? There, there's some things that we can say this is not good that we take from our family. And it's not judging them. We're not saying they're evil people. You know, I'm not saying they're evil people, they deserve their nation, they deserve their help. No, we're not saying that. We're saying, look, not everybody's perfect. And we understand with our time that they actually did the best they could with their circumstances. They did the best they could, especially in our generation, coming from Egypt. We understand their culture is very different from our culture. You know, over there you have to beat your kids all the time. You know, some parents beat their kids, some parents didn't. But this is what they knew. They didn't want any better. They fought. I want to raise my kids to be the best kid in the world. I want to love them. I want to make them a man. That's my job. So you know, I'm going to be really rough with them. Because I'm going to make them like a man. You know? But this is not the way to be done. But they had the right intention in their heart. So we understand going back is not to judge them in a, in a negative way. It's acknowledge the good and the not so good. 
And that they themselves at the time, especially in Egypt, did not have help. They did not go to counselors. They did not go speak openly about their family issues like we do in America. You know, something happens in the family, it stays in the family, it is what it is. And nobody has to about it for generations. Someone can be sexually abused in the family, and it goes down generations. Nobody knows about it. You know, because nothing can be said. So these people suffer from generation to generation because we just can't speak about it. But we're in a different generation. We have help, we have the internet, we have the openness of our culture that will help us deal with this. So we understand they were not in the best situation in life, and they did the best they could. And then, something else that's very important to know is sometimes when our parents, we could be really upset with our parents when we go into this. Because this is a very difficult thing to do. And like I said, anything that's, that's very hard could be very revolutionary to our lives. It will set our lives free, but it's a very hard thing to do. It can be dangerous, because you don't want to go into this and face your past where you're going to end up hating your parents more. So you have to acknowledge, look, if my parents didn't treat me well, it wasn't because I was not good enough, it wasn't because they are just mean people, but it's really, as they say, it's a result of what was handed down to them in their life, not really a reflection of who I am or if they love me. Because at the end, you know, our parents love us. It's just the way that they show love is not the way we want to accept love, or we should be accepted. But they actually love us. And I'll be honest with you, there is, when you look at all the different trends of what happened in our lives, a few certain things are results, in certain different degrees of, the, the, of what happened in our families. One, a lot is low self-esteem, or a certain degree of self-esteem. We don't feel that we have a lot of self-worth or value. And we may not even realize it, but it comes out in certain ways. You know? And this is a, a big result. A lot of times it's one of the main things that we get from many factors of things that happen in the family. One is low self-esteem. Sometimes the ability, we're not able to control our anger. We get frustrated something and we, we don't deal with our feelings properly. I'm angry, I'm upset, I'm sad, I don't even know what's wrong And then I don't even know how to deal with it. That's another major result from how we are with our families. And the third thing is inability to let things go. That's usually a result too. We just can't let things go. Or we can't resolve conflict. We don't know how to resolve issues. This is a third thing that kind of comes down. These are the three main things that come down. But I'll give you a few examples, and this is meant to just get our minds going. Like we said last week, tons of examples. Things, you know, why can't I say no to the woman when I really have an exam? I can't do this. Why am I no willing to say no to the woman? Why can't I say no to my friend? You know, why do I have to compete in this situation? So we're looking back now and we're going to reflect on a few examples here and make us think, you know, let's sit back and think, you know, what's going on with my family? What's going on with me? How did this affect us? Do I want to change this? Yes, I do. How do I change this? So one is sometimes parents are really tough. Parents can be tough, especially if they're not just Egyptian, Italian parents, Irish parents, all of them are very rough. And they feel like, you know what, well, especially the man is like, you know what, well, my child, my son will make him a man. You think they'll make him a man from age one, right? So, a lot of times, and it's known especially in the, in the East, there's no emotional, they don't show you emotion. There are a lot of fathers that go to their kids and say, I love you, and give them a hug, and give them a kiss. A lot of fathers don't do that. They just, it's not what they do, it's not what they're used to, they don't do it. So sometimes, we can actually, the way we are, the way we're affected by it, is we actually don't feel that, you know, we have value. We feel like they don't really love us. And then we ourselves can either imitate them when we get older and we don't show compassion and love to people, or we go to the complete opposite, where we really need to show love and compassion, and we seek it from other people. And we seek it a lot. And we get upset that we don't get it. So there's all these different things that can come out of something like that. For example, sometimes we have parents that can say, ah, uh, yeah, he's got to go stupid, and the or whatever. Parents do that. Some parents, I see they tell their kids, what are you doing? And then they don't realize their kid keeps hearing that. And then he starts thinking, you know what? I'm, I can't really do things. I keep getting, I keep saying I'm naked. So like, well, I probably am an idiot. Kid doesn't know better. But usually a little kid doesn't know and seem to be like, dad, mom, you're wrong. So, no, they don't say that. So we end up, Growing up, realizing, you know what, I don't have self-worth. You know, I, I'm kind of lacking in self-esteem a little bit. And then we go seek it in other things. Like I said, sometimes we can seek it in multiple relationships. Sometimes we can seek it in friends. To the point, uh, we can even seek it in our friends so much that we lie to make ourselves look good in our friends. We lie, we step on other people, make up stories, 
We do whatever it takes. Sometimes people have money. So like, you know what? I'm gonna buy my friends everything. Because I want them to be it. I want to be part of their group. I want them to be like the best kid there. So we're looking to raise ourselves up because we were never actually raised up in a family. We never felt that we had worth in our family. And we actually tried to project that in other ways and, and lift ourselves up in wrong ways. And sometimes, obviously, when a parent curses a kid out, or is, is used to cursing the family, just cursing the family, a lot of times the children are like, no, oh, I curse, I guess I curse, very easily. So they don't see that there's anything wrong with it because they're just used to it. Or they know there's something wrong with it, but they let it go. And sometimes, we see it too, sometimes parents make fun of their children, make fun of people. It's not always a good day. It really hurts them. Um, and I want to say something. I have, I know someone, that their kid, their child, had like a 98 on their report card. The parent was annoying. He said, you should have got one or two. I think they're or something. I don't know. You can get a parent, you can get above 100. In my days, I don't know why I wasn't able to pass 100, but you can get over 100. So they're annoying at 98. They're annoying at 98. So I was thinking in my head, I'm like, 90, I love 90, 98, you know? But the kid, you know, you can tell the kid is starting to feel like, you know, maybe it's not good enough. They keep trying whatever I can, and they just, I still can't make my parents happy. You know, they didn't say good job, I'm proud of them. Like, you should have gotten my one or two, you should have studied harder. It's like, come on. So these kids, sometimes we grow up and we feel ourselves like, no matter what I do, I keep working hard to get, to feel, I gotta keep working hard to let my parents love me. Or work hard to feel worth. So you can come into a marriage and all you gotta do is work hard, work hard, work hard. You don't spend quality time. You think that you're actually better in the relationship because you're working hard. So a lot of these things kind of do affect us. Another thing, I ever get parents that say, you know, why don't you be like your brother? Why don't you be like your cousin or this person in church? All of a sudden, comparison. So we start, if it gets really deep, you know, everybody has a different degrees. We start comparing ourselves to other people. And then there it goes. Sometimes in reality, I, you know, I can't do what this kid does. Because in reality, this kid's smarter than me. It is what it is. You know, this kid's not going to ask for me. You know, he's taller. I can't feel like him. You know, and we start comparing. And we start comparing apples to oranges sometimes. And we can't become an orange because we're an apple. But then we do what we can to become an orange. And then we see in our life, we're just, we keep trying to imitate other people, or to hit standards, and we just really can never attain. In reality, we're not being ourselves. We put on masks, and we're trying to be someone else for our whole life in different ways, in different things. But in reality, we, we're not being ourselves. Because we were breeding, we were bred to compare, we were bred to, to like, look at this person and say, why can I, can I not be just like this person? There's also, it kind of creates sometimes a health condition, and sometimes it just start hating because of it. Start hating the brother. You don't want to be around them. There's, there's animosity. You know what? I'm sick and tired of being compared to this person. I don't want to be friends with them. I don't want to talk about them. So there's so many unhealthy things that as parents, parents may do that we may not realize. And a lot of things, and it depends even the conversation parents have. If it's based on possessions, if they're always talking about possessions, if they're working hard, if they're buying, if they keep talking about buying cars, buying this, buying that, all of a sudden they feel that for me to have value as well, I have to have possessions. You see, some of us were like, we're focused on possessions. Like, the more possessions I have, the more people will like, the more I'll be accepted. So we don't, we're not actually sometimes right to be accepted just for who we are. We don't feel that we have value for who we are. And this is something, unfortunately, that could be right from our childhood. Now, another thing, some parents just have, they have anger for whatever reason. They have a lot of anger. They have a short time for it. Short things, just yell, yell, raise. Very simple thing. What is the first thing that a child gets from that? One, lack of security. I can't ask my dad anything. I, I used to hate it when, when uh, I was a kid and we broke into the things. You have a little kid, and I'm like, you know, I'm like, one kid, I wanted to just touch his head, like, you know, just kind of show him some compassion. Go like this, and the kid goes like this. What's going on? And I started putting the family together, I'm like, you know what the dad is? Every time someone goes towards his face, he's getting slapped. So this kid has no sense of security. He's not even trusting people outside. He's not even trusting the boom. He's not even trusting the defense. So we see that these things have deep-rooted effects, right? 
So lack of security, I can't ask my dad anything. My dad as a father figure is so rough on security. You know, and then a lot of a lot of us when we look at we kind of compare God to our father. For God is really rough. We kind of have the image of God as being a very rough, strict, rule driven God that doesn't show compassion. For Father is very compassionate. It's much easier for us to understand the love and compassion of the Lord Jesus Christ. But a lot of times we may not feel that way because our parents are just so easy to yell, so easy to get angry at us. And obviously this affects our security. Not just with parents, with God, and also with other people. We feel like we can't ask questions. We come to church, you know, do you have any questions? We have a question we can't ask you. We're just too embarrassed. Or we just feel like we're going to get rejected. I can't ask, you know, to get next in the game. I'm too embarrassed to get next in the basketball game. Even to that extent. So there's a lack of security, you know, a fear of people. And of course, like I said, it always come back lack of self esteem, no ownership. I'm too scared to say I did this or I want this because I feel like I'm going to get a little bit I'm going to get attacked. And then sometimes we ourselves own an angry parent. We may either become the angry in the same way, and our habits that are we're rude and we're, we're evil, we have a short fuse, and it's kind of like father like son type of thing, or like mom like daughter. Or we may go the opposite way. I'm not going to yell at my dad. But you know what? I'm going to go to the extreme opposite where I have no rules and I can't even control my kids. So there's all these extremes, all these imbalances that come. Sometimes. We have parents that are too rule driven. Everything is set by rules, 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 rules. And out of these rules, we just expect if I follow rules, I'll feel loved. If I follow rules, I'll be fine. And life is not that way. If you follow a rule, it doesn't mean you're going to be accepted. And you start socially, we don't know how to interact with people. Because there's no rules to life sometimes. I don't know how. There's no rules to friendship sometimes. How do we become friends? I don't know how. Is there a rule that everybody gives all the time? We don't know how to deal with them. And then all of a sudden, self value goes down. A lot of times, our self-esteem and the value of who we are is brought down. Again, guilt. If you don't follow a specific rule, you feel so guilty because your whole life is rules. So if any kind of rule that you break, you can't do, and you can't even deal with, you feel extremely guilty. And of course, when it comes to rules, when we get older, when we try to break people, we get, older, we, we get too stubborn because our whole life was rules. My way or the highway. You can't even talk to your parents. You can't discuss with your parents because it's either this or that. End of story. And we think, sometimes parents think like, this is the right way to raise kids. Yes or no. You know, you do this, if you don't do it, you get punished. The kid can't explain. Sometimes the kid has a story. If something happened, we just blame them and we don't want to hear them out. And they have an actual story to tell us. And it's just rules. So they get older and they can't become their circle in church. We need to do this this way. We need to do this way. They can't agree. There's no interaction. They, just can't, they can't grasp it because their whole life was all this world or all this world. I'm just like, why do you And of course, like I said, probably the most hardest thing and the common thing in our community also is parents that don't show emotion. Like I said, they don't, we don't feel that we're loved. We don't feel that we, we, we can show emotion back. And then we show emotion back and then they don't receive it well and then we think, how do you show emotion? You know, what are we supposed to do? And then we ourselves are used to never show emotion. And then if people get married and they say, you know, my husband never kisses me, never gives me a hug. He doesn't love me. It's just how it is. Yeah, but you know what? We're not made not to love. We're made to love. We're made to kiss. We're made to, to, to show compassion and love. But we kind of train ourselves not to do this. Then when a, a, a husband or wife, they're upset and they say, you know, I'm talking to her. And you know, we had a disagreement and she's not talking, she's just angry, she doesn't want to talk to me. But she doesn't want to tell me why she's upset. Part of this goes back to how we were brought up in our household. It's pretty effective. Sometimes parents are too controlling. You can never leave the house, you can never do this, you can never do that. Anything you do, you have to know every single detail and it has to be their way. It's so strange. What ends up happening? Two things specific out of this. One, a child needs to be free. So they're not going to be somewhat rebellious at a young age. They go out to college, and it's like a complete other person. Someone was telling me the story of this, uh, I don't know who it is. It's a person who's training his son to like an athlete. The kid never ate a, a hamburger until he went to college. That's what, that's what I was told. So sometime in college, he got, you know, he died of cocaine, or I don't know, he ruined his career because of cocaine. So he went and was like, oh my god, complete freedom. I've never tasted this before. 
So sometimes being too controlling, you know, you hold something too tight, you break it. And that's sometimes what some parents do, we're just way too controlling. And what are the results of our life? Are we too rebellious? Or are we also not used to being free? So we grow up and you go to a job and you have all the authority. You go to school and you're still your parents are controlling you. You go to school and you're doing everything, then you go out to the free world and you get a job, now there's no control. The boss is like, all right, figure it out, and I don't know what to do. I've never done anything on my own, ever. I've always had rules, I've always had guidance, I've never. All these things happen. So these are things you have to look back and say, why am I having trouble? What happened in the past that I need to, I need to know? Sometimes parents are manipulative, and we become manipulative like them. And then some things that happen the complete opposite way. Sometimes a parent loves their child so much that they spoil the child. So they show them, they give them pieces all the time, hugs all the time, which is good. But it gets to the point where anything wrong can happen. So the extreme opposite is they get spoiled. And what happens when being spoiled? Sometimes the child comes to church, it doesn't listen to Abuna, doesn't listen to the servants, doesn't listen to the teacher at school, because you know what? I can do whatever I want, I'm king at home. You can't tell me anything. Right? And they, they, they have their boundaries, they don't understand what boundaries and limits are. And this obviously happens a lot. Sometimes the parents raise the kid to think he's the best thing ever made on earth. And the kid becomes so selfish and prideful and stubborn and he gets it. Come say it's very snotty. And then they're very rude in their life. They're very rude to women, they're very rude to men, they're very rude to people, to authorities, they don't obey, they don't do anything because they were extremely spoiled in their young. Alright? And honestly, what comes out of that too is jealousy. Because you can't imagine what you want. So sometimes you tell a person like that, especially no. Forget it. It's that in the world. You told me no, I can't accept no. How can I? I can always get what I want. And they themselves, they just you tell them no, you can't have this right now, or you can't do this right now. I was in the public. No, I'm sorry, I can't go with you. I can't, I can't go, I, I'm not going to ride with you this place and go somewhere else. They get so upset, how can you not ride with them? You don't understand that, I'm just, it's so simple. I'm not going to ride with you, I'm going to ride with this person. Just, I don't want to hear it. The person is so upset because you as a friend, they're not going with this specific place. And you can't explain why. For me, there's just drama. There's drama, I don't want to be there. But there's something, there's some reason to it. Maybe they're like, you know, they can't accept them all. They've never had them Or they're so needy because their parents never showed them you know, enough of compassion that they themselves are saying, you know what, I can't bear a friend not showing me compassion all the time or part of the time. So we're too attached to that. We can't be independent. You know? We can't be independent. We're too dependent on people. So these are very, you know, we're talking about things that are very difficult. That maybe we may have touched on one or multiple things that may have happened in our life to an extent that we need to look at deeper. But these are things that, you know, unfortunately it's very hard to understand. It's very hard to go through this and we need to go through it. For us to take the next step and get over this mountain and completely be free and to soar like an eagle, we really need to face the past. I'll just say a few quick things. Parents are always working all the time, so they need to. But we have in our mind money, money, money. Money is the, is the way to raise a family to have some attractions and make friends that work hard. We just we're workaholics. Sometimes the way a father treats his wife, a mother, the father treats his, his, his spouse. Very rough, very certain you know, the woman can't speak, she can't do anything. Sometimes the woman, the girls grow up the same way, she's not independent at all, she can't do anything. Or she grow up to the opposite, you know what, I don't want to be like my parents. You know, I'm going to speak, I'm going to do this all the time. And I, then the woman becomes too rebellious, where she just, she, you can't even speak. Um, we also have what we see, our views, and this is something in common in our culture. When someone passes away, then the memorial comes. It's the most awkward thing in the whole world. You spend it every year in the memorial in the house, eating, everybody's like, oh my body, it's sad, and you don't know what you're doing. You're not remembering the loved one, you're not remembering anything. So we, ourselves, as culture, actually, we're very extreme. If a person dies, we go nuts. We scream like crazy, right? They used to say in Egypt, we used to hire someone, pay them, their job was to scream and cry at weddings, or sorry, at funerals, right? <laughs> <laughs> but the job is to, to cry at, uh, at funerals, like insane. You know, we need drama. But then at the end, you know, like how do we actually deal with it? We don't deal in our culture for sure. Not in Christianity, but in our culture sometimes. And I guess it might be in Islamic influence or whatever it is. We don't deal with death at the end of the day. Our yearly memorials are very like boring. 
very awkward. We don't sit and remember the good things that our parents or our relatives went through or whoever passed away. We don't remember the joys and laugh and the joys sometimes. No. Some people do. I believe the majority don't. It's very awkward. It's like embarrassing. It's, you can't for 10 years, you can talk about your relative without like all of them. Well, you shouldn't get to that point where we go for 50 years. We're crying 50 years because we can't. We can't, we can't even talk about our relatives. We can't say their name. We can't even think of it. This is very unhealthy. So we don't even deal sometimes with that well. And this gets passed on generations. We don't know what to do. We never taught how to deal with it. Um, sometimes gossip. Our parents gossip in front of us about one another. All of a sudden, we think everybody that we meet has a negative agenda. The cups always have empathy. And it's very big. This becomes very deeply rooted in our mind and hearts that everyone is evil. Evil, evil, evil. Everyone has such a, why did he ask me for this? Or why is he doing this for me? You know, does he want something back? You know? And it comes from what we hear. Anything we hear influences us big time. If our parents don't gossip in front of us, all of a sudden everybody in church, everybody in school, everybody in the world is out to get it. Or has a negative intention. Or they do one thing that looks like a negative, looks wrong. We don't get the benefit of that. We don't understand what the benefit of that is. It's always negative, negative, negative. It's a result. Actually, some people don't come to church because the parents talk a bit about a woman, about the demons, about this, and the kids are like, why are you going to church? All hypocrites anyway. You know, I just heard, you know, this Abuna, there was a situation happened, and I heard only half the story. And half the story I heard is bad, so I don't even respect the woman anymore. Why should I come to church? And people are, are completely away from the church, away from God, because you know what? They feel like everybody's a hypocrite. Because the parents gossip, gossip, gossip. And I say gossip because they don't always have the whole story. A lot of times they don't have the whole story. And then the last thing is sometimes we are basically, we, we have stuff results that happen in our family, not because our parents did anything wrong in terms of, you know, their culture and how they dealt with each other, but a, some traumatic event happened in our family. Sometimes, you know, we, our parents are always fighting. They're having trouble in their marriage. You know, they're good people, they love us, but they're having trouble. They just didn't work out their marriage for a few years. So even the first six years of your life, your parents always fight and they finally worked out. But these 10 years actually fetch. Some people look and say, you know what? My parents are divorced. Something like that. And I say to myself, you know what? Like, I can never think, every, every woman that I see, like, I don't even know if I want to get married. I look for a woman that doesn't fall. Because you know what? I feel like my mom, you know, was, was so rough. And then you know what? Like, it's going to be a horrible life. All women are crazy. Someone look at men and say, oh, my father was abusive. You know what? And any husband I see, any man I see, anything he does, I think he's doing it in the wrong way. I think he's evil. So we project our parents to our future spouse or to anyone who looked at them. So we don't realize the depth of how things are ingrained in the back of our mind and hearts and how we approach things in life. And our view of the entire life is based off how we grew up in our family. Also, <coughs> single parents. Uh, a lot of times the kids, you know, they're made to feel to have a father figure and a mother figure. A lot of times, due to the death, due to the illness, due to whatever, divorce, one of them doesn't have it. So they start seeking this love in other ways, monetarily. They don't know what to do, they don't speak about it. There's tons of things coming up. Right? And of course, uh, then comes two very difficult things is uh, when some parent is sick for a long time for life and the family really sick, that also has an effect on, on, on the children. You know, it has a deep effect on them. Not even, even though they're here, they're sick. You know, so there's illness, illnesses in the family. This, you know, they're always going to hospital back and forth. This has a deep effect on the children and how they, they progress in life. And of course, a negative thing that we don't ever, we hope we never get to is abuse. Physical abuse, sexual abuse, that happens in the family. This is extreme when some parents speak their kids beat their lives in front of their kids. You know, this is a And then, even worse, some people, some parents, uh, or, or siblings, sexual abuse their, uh, their siblings or their, their children. And this, this is very difficult, because at the end of the day, you know, this person is suffering from something. Why is he actually sexually abusing this person? Why is he physically beating this person? And these people, sometimes, like, the people get sexually abused, you know, sometimes they get suicidal. You know, sometimes they feel they're so dirty that they, they feel like it's their fault. A lot of times you read a line like, 
prisons against sexual abuse because it is their fault why they're sexually abused. Or why they're physically abused, why they're beat. It's their fault that they got beat. Everything is their fault. They can never tell someone, you know, it's their fault. Everything's effect on them. They live a very depressed life. Sometimes these people that are abused like this, they actually, you know, they, like they said, there's some kind of trend where these people will go out and then they'll marry someone, for whatever reason, they want to they'll marry someone who will abuse them physically or sexually. And, and they end up, their whole life is abuse. Because, well, that's all they knew. And for some reason, they look towards a father or a brother or a sister that's the same way, and they just, without realizing it, and they live their whole life sad. But for some reason, sometimes they chose a person to abuse them. They can't get out of this abusive relationship. This is deep, deep, deep down. It goes back to how we are in our environment as we grow. Um, these are really just touching the surface, really, of all the things that can happen in our family, in, our, in, in the environment of our family, um, and how it could affect us. And what we really need to do is, as they say, get past that. So now that we kind of touched on everything, it's very difficult. How do we ourselves get through this? That's the question. How do we actually get through this? That's the hard Okay, fine. We laid out already that there's things to progress, you know, stop because we're progressing spiritually. We laid out the fact that there are things that are symptoms that we see that we're not really being ourselves. You know, really, we're, we're, our real self is very real. But then we brought up the things that happen that are painful that may have happened in our family. What do we do? Thank you very much. All right? Thank you very much. You know, you made my life miserable now. You know, I, I, I point out a bunch of things. What do I do now in my life? You know, what do I do? So steps to go forward, obviously. We really just have to think about it. Whether we say, let's just go back to our family and think about everything that happened in our life. How is my family life? And project it. Or the opposite way, you know, I heard all these examples. Which one am I? You know, why can I not say no to people? Let me go back. Why can I say no? What really can I say no? So we really need to sit with ourselves and really sit and it can take weeks, it can take months to really get to the depth of things. But we need to. Second, we need to pray. We really need to pray and we need to pray continuously. Con constantly we need to pray. Because we need strength to get through. And then, please, and I beg you for this, I beg you for this, it's very hard to get through this alone. When you take this journey, and it's a very difficult journey, you need someone. You always need someone. Of course, you have God. But well, a lot of times, Father Confession is a great, is a great person to be with you. A person who's going to pray for you all times. Who's going to give you guidance. Who's going to, you know, give you, you know, as much love and, and, and compassion as they can, and really support you through this process of going through it. And if you don't, if you can't speak to Father Confession for whatever reason, you need to trust a friend, a friend that you really can trust. That can really not, you know, that can, 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 can really, you know, you don't feel like he's judging you. You don't feel like he can give, you know, share your story. And he's really going to sit by you and support you in every way. It's very important to have someone with you. It's not good to be alone. And of course, sometimes in the extreme case, or in actually certain cases, like we need counseling. Sometimes we need professional help. If someone's being physically or sexually abused as a young person, if the facts are still there and it's very hard to deal with, Sometimes in reality, a Buddha can do all they can, but sometimes he's not a counselor. Actually, there are two priests that have counseling degrees. You know, so even if a person they want to go to an actual counselor, they just go to these specific priests or they need to go question out. You know, the, the priests or friends don't really know how, as Nina said before, we don't have the tools to help us go sometimes. But it's very important to get through this. Um, and of course, as we do this, keep in mind some circumstances require that we just forgive and forget. What if this parent died, right? What if it's about certain things that happen? Someone just need to forgive and forget. You know, we have to learn how to forgive. And, and then this forgiveness will release us from any burden that we have. We'll be able to move towards the freedom of Christ. And sometimes, in some cases, guys, it, 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 we need to do something about it. We need to speak, especially if something's still going on. We need to speak. Sometimes we need to go and speak to our parents and be like, you know, mom, you know, dad, I gotta be honest, like, this has been really bothering me. I want to share this with you. It's it's been hurting me. I'm really upset. I don't think we should do this anymore. Or we shouldn't do this or that. You know, and we need to sometimes speak to our parents or speak to our uncles or speak to whoever it is to clear the air. Sometimes it's very important for us. It's very important for us to do that. But of course, how do we know when to speak? When we just forgive them? You know, this will take guidance from the Father Confession from one of our people. So I'm sorry, guys. 
you know, it, this took a little longer to relate. Uh, my apologies. But it's a very important topic. And you want to take off, like it says, it's about to take off the old man and put on the new one. We did that in baptism. But even though we did in baptism, sometimes we bury ourselves in there because we're not dealing with our rest of our life. So it's a difficult, painful journey. I pray that we can all live with the strength that God gives us the grace, the Holy Spirit that's dwelling in us, can give us the strength and the support to go through this, to get past this past, to get over this mountain, and then really soar like an eagle. And I pray that God can give us all grace and all the glory to God for Two or three quick announcements. There is uh, the ESYC, go to ESYC, the board, there's a graduate retreat on uh, November 7th to 9th. Um, Paul Gears is the one giving the talk. Uh, speaking of retreat, then there's something called the One Cop. If you go to onecop.org, there's a national convention for all of North America, Canada, and America, all of North America. It's going to be in Florida, October 30th to November 2nd, right? It's like four days or something, three, four days. So it's a national convention for the entire North America, which is pretty cool, the first one. Those are two of the affidavits meeting this Thursday night. And if you need to, if you want to help with the festival, talk to Mina Khair, talk to Andy Khalil, talk to nobody else is here. Right? Talk to these two men, all the said. These are the three people who want to talk about help with the festival. Speak to them. And we'll let it to Thank you.